So what's the point? Uh, why should you care about discreteness? Uh, I, I have thought of several examples, several kind of interesting models that employ discreteness inside and which you might be interested in using. So one distinct feature of uh, discrete latent variables, of discrete variables, is that they are easier to interpret. For us humans, it's way easier to make sense of discrete categories of some uh, discrete number rather than the continuous spectrum uh, of uh, many different values. Uh, in that sense, uh, it might be easier, you might be interested in learning, um, in training a discrete variational autoencoder. You have been just presented the standard variational autoencoder model where the latent code, the Z, is continuous, uh, some Gaussian vector. But uh, what if you want to have, say, Bernoulli distributed uh, hidden representation, the discrete representation? Then it would be easier to try to interpret which every single uh, component of this latent hidden representation means. Uh, so then you would, of course, uh, would like to train both the encoder and the decoder network to w be able to work with such discrete representations. Another uh, idea, another possible application, is the idea of uh, a neural network making discrete choices inside of it. Uh, for example, uh, you all probably are familiar with the idea of soft, at soft attention uh, as a building block of a neural network. But uh, what if uh, you are interested in, say, hard attention models? The hard attention essentially assumes that there is part of your network, uh, the mask generating network, that decides which parts of the image, which areas of the image you, sh you would like to look at. So this uh, auxiliary network generates a mask, a binary mask that is then applied to the image, and it masks, masks out irrelevant parts and leaves only the relevant parts. And these relevant, relevant parts are then fed into the downstream network, say the classification network. And since the sort of the number of uh, uh, active pixels is active pixels is reduced, then you might be able to gain some performance benefits from that. Uh, then uh, there has been a very successful. At uh, application of generative modeling uh, for images, namely the generative adversarial networks approach, has been shown to be extremely successful. The samples that GANs are generating, the images that GANs are generating, are very um, plausible and realistically looking. However, they haven't had such uh, as much success when it comes to generating text, the natural language, uh, and. Uh, one of the problems in this direction is that your generator has to output some discrete tokens. It has to, the text is inherently discrete. And uh, then this text need to be, uh, th then you need to uh, supply this text into the discriminator, and then you need to back propagate the discriminator's error back all the way to the generator. So you would need to do this kind of back propagation, uh, learn the gen discrete uh, entities generating uh, network. So you, uh, that would require back propagation through the discreteness. So uh, let us state the for problem kind of more formally. Uh, formal, from the point, uh, formal standpoint, uh, all these problems boil down to a very simple objective that has the following form. So we have the, this Q phi distribution uh, is the generating distribution, the distribution that generates your discrete things. For example, the generator in the GAN, uh, in the GAN for text setting. Then the samples uh, Z are then scored by the scoring function f that gives you a reward that says how good the, the sample is. For example, again, in the GAN setting, that might be the loss of a discriminator. And we would like to maximize uh, this quantity expected over the, uh, generator, uh, over the generating distribution. So we'd like to maximize this expected reward over uh, the parameters of the, generating phi, of the generator phi. Now, in order to make the whole thing kind of uh, meaningful from the mathematical standpoint, we would require that uh, this uh, expected loss at least uh, is differentiable with respect to phi. The true gradient in the mathematical sense exists, then uh, at least we have some hope at doing the gradient-based optimization as we usually do in deep learning these days. 
uh, of course, uh, but in practice, uh, in many, uh, in most of the interesting scenarios, we will be unable to compute this expectation analytically because usually it involves uh, some exponential number of uh, a dense number of cements, and we are just unable to enumerate uh, all of them in uh, efficiently in some reasonable time. So instead, we'll opt out for we'll uh, go for um, stochastic optimization. Uh, and uh, the stochastic optimization, the only thing it requires to work is an unbiased estimate of the gradient. We seek to construct uh, the function g uh, that has some randomness inside uh, that uh, when averaged over this randomness, in this case, for example, say the random variable z, then we recover the true gradient. Uh, uh, however, one problem that uh, you, uh, we should uh, sort of po point out right away, so from the uh, first lecture, you probably remember that uh, well, there is, uh, you have been presented with uh, one a very efficient trick, namely the reparameterization based gradient estimation trick. Uh, the big problem with discrete random variables is that Although you can write uh, a reparameterization for discrete random variables, none of such reparameterizations would be differentiable. Every single reparameterization for discrete random variable has to be non-differentiable for a simple reason. Discrete random variables take on finite amount of values. Then this they cannot be differentiable. Uh, but still, you are presented with uh, yet another gradient estimator, namely the reinforce estimator. I will briefly remind you what the reinforce estimator looks like. So we seek to estimate, uh, we seek to compute the gradient of our expected reward with respect to parameters of the generating distribution Q phi. So we ex first expand this expectation as a sum, as a weighted sum over all possible outcomes. Now, since this is a, well, we'll assume that this is a finite sum or at least some regularity conditions hold, and we can interchange the summation and the differentiation operators. So the differentiation is now inside of the summation. And only one of the terms, namely the uh, weights, uh, the probabilities of uh, our sample Z, only this term depends on phi. Now we use the probably well familiar to you uh, at this point trick called the log derivative trick that basically says that if you have the gradient of a probability, then this is the same as that probability multiplied by the gradient of the log probability. Uh, if you missed this during the first lecture, this is a very simple t uh, technique, uh, very simple uh, identity. You can verify it yourself by just expanding the, uh, by just simplifying the left-hand side. Uh, now, by we put this, uh, the left-hand side uh, uh, into the uh, uh, into this expression, and we obtain the, the following expression, the following sum. Now, if you look at it, you see that this is essentially a weighted sum of a different uh, thing, namely, this is an expectation over the same uh, distribution q phi, phi of z of uh, f of z that has now been m multiplied by the gradient of the log probability uh, and has the, the following form. Uh, again, uh, th this is uh, uh, again an expectation over an expon po possibly exponential number of uh, summands uh, and we are unable to compute it analytically. So we uh, go for a Monte Carlo estimation. We assume that we can efficiently draw samples from the distribution Q and we can form the following Monte Carlo estimation using capital M independent identical distributed samples from Q. Uh, this uh, estimator uh, G is co usually called uh, the reinforced estimator. Uh, in some literature is also called uh, the score function estimator or the log derivative trick estimator, but we will stick with the reinforce uh, in this lecture. So the reinforced estimator, uh, let's take a closer look at it. So uh, it has uh, the, the, this form, and uh, luckily it works in our case, it works for discrete random variables. Unlike the reparameterization trick, the discreteness of our samples does not get in the way, it does not prevent us from estimating the gradient. Uh, what's even more interesting is that F is not even required to be differentiable. We, only, we are only relying on the values of f, and nowhere did we assume that f is, uh, say, differentiable. Uh, 
Uh, however, in practice, people have noticed, and I guess you were told already, that reinforced typically has large and, and uh, impractical variants. So in practice, to use uh, the reinforce, what people do, people use uh, quite sophisticated variance reduction techniques. And uh, uh, well, you could say, okay, let's just take more samples, capital M, and that would reduce our variance, right? Technically, yes, but uh, the variance reduction rate is kind of modest. Uh, if you take uh, capital M samples, then the typical error, uh, which is proportional to the standard deviation, would only decrease uh, as a square root of M, as one over square root of M, which is um, not very um, uh, practical use of uh, more computational, uh, more computation. Uh, moreover, in practice, uh, sometimes you can't get more than one sample, uh, and uh, sometimes it's convenient to use, uh, and people actually often use just single sample, the capital M is equal to one. So, uh, what makes the reinforce so bad? Why uh, a bad empirical performance? Uh, well, Consider a single sample estimate, uh, the one people, as I said, usually use. It has the following simple form. Uh, the gradient is proportional to the f of s, f of z, multiplied by the gradient of the log probability. So the direction of this gradient is completely determined by the second, the red term, the gradient of the log probability. And the function, the reward function f of z, only defines the magnitude of this uh, direction. So when you actually make a gradient step, what you do is you increase the probability of a sample z in proportion to the reward it gives you. So if the reward is large, if f of z is large, then you will make a big step. That, makes, uh, that means that this, is, uh, this sample is probably very good and uh, its probability should be uh, increased. But uh, if f of z, say, is negative, then uh, that means that uh, the sample only contributes negative uh, reward, uh, and you would like to avoid it, so you run in an opposite direction. Uh, but uh, this behavior, this kind of behavior, when the good samples uh, get their probability increased and the bad samples get their probability decreased, for uh, random samples, you see the samples Z are not uh, obtained in some systematical way. They are random samples from our distribution. This reminds uh, us the random search behavior. This looks very much like a random search. Uh, also, uh, for those of you who are familiar with the optimization theory, you might um, be concerned uh, that we are only using the values of function f. We do not use the gradient information. Uh, and this is very counterintuitive, since we are kinda, we're kind of estimating the gradient, and yet we don't use the gradient of f. So uh, with all of this, I would argue that the reinforce is more like a zeroth order uh, optimization method. It uh, pretends to be a gradient-based one, but um, uh, it's not really, uh, yeah, a question? Uh, yes, so uh, when you're saying that it doesn't use gradient, uh, for example, if we want to, to use reinforce in, in, uh, in the variational autoencoder, that would mean that actually we're not using the gradient of the decoder, right? When we, proper, right. When, when we compute the gradients of the, uh, okay. Yeah, exactly. Uh, in the in the VAE case, uh, the F would be your log joint, log P of uh, X and Z, and uh, you would not be using the gradient of the decoder network. You would only be using the values of a uh, uh, decoder network. Uh, one thing to notice is that uh, since uh, our gradient estimator only depends on the values of the function, then just adding a simple constant, just adding some constant c to the function f will change the estimator. That means our estimator is sensitive to constant shifts in the function, uh, which would not be the case in the reparameterization trick, for example. The reparameterization trick only uses the gradient of f and does not use the value of f itself. Uh, so th this lets us conclude that the uh, reinforce, again, is a random search in disguise. It pretends to be a gradient-based method, but uh, in fact, it's a random search. Uh, 
Uh, okay, so having bashed the reinforce for a while, uh, now let's uh, try to leverage the reparameterization, the good things of the reparameterization trick. As I said, uh, you can write down the reparameterization for con discrete random variables, but they are not differentiable, so uh, no luck with the gradient estimator. So in order to have the differentiable reparameterization, we need to relax our discrete random variables. We need to move to continuous case that, and uh, the idea here is to first approximate our discrete problem with the continuous problem. Here the z are discrete random variables and z tilde are continuous random variables that are hopefully kind of exhibit similar behavior to the discrete case. And then we can reparameterize this, uh, this continuous uh, z tilde using some independent uh, standard noise gamma. So the z tildes are obtained as a deterministic transformation of uh, gammas. Uh, notably, importantly, the uh, one important thing to keep in mind is that we would still like to, although we changed, we switched from the discrete model to the continuous one during the training stage, we would still like to leverage all the benefits, reap all the good things of a discrete case during the testing stage. We, was, we still want to use discrete model during the testing stage. That means uh, we train the continuous model and then we evaluate the discrete model. Uh, also, since we are trying to use, since we seek to use the uh, reparameterization based uh, est gradient estimator, uh, that means that our f, function f, now has to be differentiable. It has to be differentiable with respect to its input. Uh, that kind of limits the scope uh, where we can use these methods. So, the uh, core idea in, in the particular rel relaxation we'll be talking about uh, is called the Gumbel Max trick. It's a very old trick from the graphical models community uh, that used it for a different reason, but um, we'll uh, use a very simple instance of it. So consider having a categorical random variable Z that has capital K different outcomes, each one with a probability pi one to pi K, uh, and uh, it can be shown that in a sense, uh, this categorical random variable can be obtained through a slightly different process, through a um, simple optimization problem. So suppose you have capital K independent, identically distributed, exponentially, standardly, uh, identically distributed random variables Z to K, and, all, and they all are, uh, have a standard exponential distribution. Now you can divide, if you divide each z to k by the corresponding probability pi k, and then find the minimal index of such a vector uh, given by the argmin uh, over k, then the number you get, uh, this uh, random number uh, actually, will have the categorical distribution. It means that in, if you want to say sample categorical distribution from uh, uh, if you want to sample such z from th this categorical distribution, one way to do so would be through the following uh, formula, which is uh, kind of easy to compute. Uh, to make things kind of a little bit more computationally stable, we apply a minus logarithm and uh, equivalently obtain the following uh, identity, the following actually reparameterization. It lets us reparameterize uh, the categorical random variable in uh, th through an independent random variable z to k, and uh, this reparameterization lets us separate dependent the parameters we are interested in optimizing over, in this case the pi's, and uh, the randomness that uh, turns, um, that gives us stochasticity, in this case the zetas, or uh, the minus logarithm the zetas, which I denoted as gamma subscript k. Uh, of course, this uh, uh, reparameterization is non-differentiable. We cannot, uh, although it has simple form, and it uh, separated these uh, log parameters which we're interested in optimizing, in, in computing the differentiating with respect to, uh, the argmax operator is non-differentiable. Uh, 
also, I should say that uh, the gamma k here uh, has the Gumbel soft max distribution. If you have the standard expansion and variable zeta, then the minus logarithm of zeta has the standard Gumbel distribution and hence the name of the trick. Uh, so having the argmax, the only problem, the only point of non-differentiability, let's relax the argmax. That would give us a continuous relaxation that is amendable to a reparameterization, uh, to the reparameterization trick uh, based gradient estimation. And the relaxation we'll be using uh, is the softmax. The very natural, it's very natural thing to approximate the argmax with the softmax, right? Uh, in particular, we'll be using the softmax with the temperature, uh, the temperature parameter tau here, uh, and it's, well, basically the very well familiar to all of you softmax, except we have scaled the arguments with the inverse temperature. Uh, the idea behind the temperature is that it allows us to con to control the sharpness, the steepness of the softmax. In particular, in the case of zero temperature, if tau is equal to one, then you can show that the argmax uh, is, uh, that the argmax is recovered. That is, the softmax with the zero temperature exactly coincides with the argmax. On the other side of the spectrum, when the temperature is infinite, then the softmax output is, uh, un is uniform distribution. So for v values in between, you have a kind of interpolation between the two. So th this, uh, uh, this, leads, uh, this uh, gives us the following reparameterization. The, our relaxed random variables z tilde will be defined as the softmax of our log probabilities, the logits. The log probabilities are called logits, uh, by the way, uh, that have been perturbed with the independent Gumbel noise each particular logit will have their own independent Gumbel noise added. And then all of these logits, perturbed logits, will be passed through the softmax with the temperature tau. Uh, these gumbels are also are easy to compute and uh, sample. In order to obtain a standard Gumbel distributed uh, random variable, you only need to apply the minus logarithm function twice to some uniformly distributed random variable. So. Uh, Everything is easy uh, to compute here. So what, uh, now we can express our relaxed objective in the following way. We just sample gammas, uh, the independent Gumbel noises, then we substitute it into this uh, softmax formula. Uh, we s fed this uh, uh, relaxed uh, Z tildes to the F, and well, this gives you the objective. Now everything is uh, differentiable along the way down to the parameters phi, so you can use the reparameterization trick based gradient estimator. Uh, so what have we just done? Uh, if you think of uh, the formula we were using, uh, this particular relaxation, it looks very much like, so suppose the temperature, the tau, uh, is equal to one and uh, the Gammas are absent. Suppose we removed all the gammas and we only left the softmax of the log probabilities. Then the z would be equal to this probability vector. It would be, in a sense, as if we just replaced the, category, the discrete uh, random variables, the categorical random variables, with their means, with their probabilities. Uh, but uh, adding noise prevents, uh, kind of pushes us around, pushes us to one side or to another side, and there are several benefits to that. So first, uh, adding noise, having noise in your neural network is usually uh, can, deemed as a good thing. Uh, you see there are dropouts, batch normalization, many other techniques that inherently introduce noise into your neural network, and they all uh, lead to uh, better results in the end. So th this acts as a regularizer. Another uh, good thing of having some noise in your network is that it leads to better exploration, the better exploration of the parameter space. Uh, but the most importantly, as I will sh show you shortly, is that um, if your noise is right, and uh, it turns out in our case the noise is right, then the, uh, it, it will actually have a smaller uh, train test mismatch. Uh, so, in particular, uh, 
uh, let us first consider a special case, the binary uh, case in the case of uh, essentially a Bernoulli random variable. If you have only two outcomes, the categorical distribution over two outcomes, then you can simplify the softmax uh, into the single component, and that single component will be essentially a sigmoid function. Now this uh, sigmoid, f this lets us define the Bernoulli relaxation, Z tilde, as the sigmoid with the temperature of the logits plus some random variable, which now has a logistic distribution. Uh, obviously, logistic distribution is a difference of two softmaxes, uh, no, sorry, of two Gumbel distrib uh, distributed random variables. Uh, and you can show it by yourself by, again, just simplifying the softmax over two outcomes. So uh, now let us see how the distribution of inputs to the sigmoid function, this shifted logistic distribution. So here, the argument of sigma is just a, some random variable shifted by some deterministic constant uh, called, uh, that is equal to logits of the pi, the uh, p. Uh, then th th this is shifted logistic distribution that gets mapped, that gets squashed by the sigmoid function into the distribution of uh, our relaxed samples z tilde. So on this plot, on the x-axis, you see this uh, shifted logistic distribution, the distribution of inputs to our function uh, sigmoid with the temperature tau. And uh, this black curve here is the sigmoid function with a temperature of one over two, with a temperature one half. Uh, then, can, suppose that your random variable uh, v, your your sample, your random variable that is represented by this uh, thing, turned out uh, realized somewhere here. Then uh, the this function, the sigmoid uh, with the temperature, maps this point to say this point, something like uh, point nine. And overall, the probability mass of inputs gets distrib gets mapped gets squashed uh, into this uh, U-shaped distribution. So uh, what it means is that you see that uh, the peaks of the distributions are at the ends of the interval. One peak is uh, the big peak at the one, and the smaller peak is at the zero. Uh, this is uh, actually a very favorable behavior if you think of it. It means that uh, you have a higher probability of having a sample from around zero or from around one, uh, and this is exactly what you'd be feeding the network with during the testing stage. At testing stage, you'd be feeding the hard ones and zeros uh, and nothing else. So you would like uh, the training distribution to be close to that. You would have to uh, have as many values close to ones or, or zeros during the training stage as possible, but uh, in the right, in a right proportion. So uh, th this plot, uh, th this distribution uh, would, would work perfectly. Uh, now we can see what happens when you choose other temperatures. For example, if the temperature is equal to one, then the function is, uh, the sigmoid function is less steep, and uh, we see that the peak at zero has disappeared. So that means that you still are likely to get lots of ones, but instead of zeros, you are likely to get some intermediate values. Uh, now, if you crank the temperature all the way down to zero, then you recover, of course, the discrete case, the gumbel max trick, the non-differentiable case, and uh, uh, you see that, well, this is indeed looks uh, very discrete, but uh, the gradients uh, do not exist. Uh, on the other hand, if the temperature is too big, then uh, the peaks at the end of the interval disappear, and the only peak you have is inside. So during the training, you will mostly be getting these intermediate values, and the network uh, can could adapt to these uh, intermediate values, and will be super confused uh, at the testing stage when you suddenly fed it with, uh, say, zero. Uh, in, the, in general, the theory says that as long as your te temperature is smaller than one over number of outcomes minus one, uh, this uh, uh, threshold, then you are guaranteed to have no peaks in, uh, in the middle of, the, uh, of your uh, probability simplex. Uh, there will be no peaks inside uh, 
uh, this uh, unit interval in the binary case. Uh, but and uh, otherwise, you are likely to have peaks inside the uh, probability the, the probability simplex, and uh, that is unfavorable behavior. We don't want this. Uh, but other than that, uh, the theory does not say tell us anything regarding how to choose a specific value of the um, temperature. And uh, basically, for uh, here you enter the classical bias variance trade-off, uh, very common in machine learning. The small temperatures reduce the bias. Uh, your relaxations match the discrete case more closely, but in the limit of zero temperature, the gradients do not exist, and hence the variance uh, blows up to infinity. On the other hand, uh, if the temperature is big, then the variance is smaller, but the... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, but the bias is much greater because you deviate further from the discrete case. Uh, so in practice, this uh, leaves you with yet another hyperparameter that needs to be tuned uh, by, say, grid search or some fancy hyperparameter optimization technique. Uh, sorry, could you get the microphone, please? A couple of slides ago, there was this, um, on slide 15, you had this Z tilde. There was this P there, like where did the P come from? Uh, sorry, what? On slide 15, there was uh, a P in the equation. Where did the P come from? Yeah. Is uh, that an arbitrary constant that's chosen? No, 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 the P is the probability, this is the Bernoulli case. The Bernoulli case is parameterized by a single probability, uh, and this is it. So let us consider a toy example. Suppose we have a four-way categorical random variable Z. It has uh, this distribution. Uh, uh, the Z takes uh, pr uh, values from zero to three with probabilities pi one to pi four. And uh, these probabilities are the outputs of a softmax. Uh, the pi's are generated by passing some theta, some per unconstrained parameters through the softmax uh, function. Then we seek to estimate the gradient for the following objective, uh, fancy, uh, interesting objective that uh, just puts your numerical value of the categorical random variable into the cosine function and then expects it over the distribution of these uh, categorical random variables. Uh, we actually are not going to do any optimization. We're only interested in estimating the gradient of this expression. So uh, the relaxed objective has the following form. We just sample gammas uh, from the Gumbel distribution independently, then we perturb our logits. In this case, the logits are given by the thetas. Then we pass it through the softmax with the temperature, which is a hyperparameter. And then, since the softmax gives us the one-hot representation of our categorical random variables, we need to convert them back to numerical values, which we do by simply multiplying, uh, by considering a scalar product, the dot product, between the one hot vector, the relaxed one hot vector, uh, with, the, with this vector of 0, 1, 2, and 3, the possible outcomes of z. Uh, now, uh, th this uh, objective is completely differentiable. You can uh, freely differentiate with respect to theta, and we can see how the gradient behaves. For example, we'll uh, consider the gradient with respect to theta 0 and consider and uh, leave or the rest thetas, theta 1, 2, and 3, fixed to, so, to certain values. Uh, it doesn't matter which ones. So here uh, you have uh, some empirical study. Uh, on the left, you see the, the average value, uh, the expected value of the gradient, kind of the real gradient, uh, this uh, relaxed objective estimate uh, for different temperatures. The black line here, the black curve, gives you the true gradient, the gradient of the original discrete problem. And uh, for, with different color, colors, you see the Gumbel relaxations for different temperatures. For example, the blue, uh, just, uh, sorry, wait for the microphone, please. Um, where do we take the gradients from the original problem from? Uh, well, th this is a very simple toyish case. You see, there are only four different uh, values, so you can compute uh, all the expectations analytically. Uh, it is not hard to sum four uh, terms. 
So uh, the blue uh, line here, the Google Soft Max estimator with the temperature of uh, 0 0.1, approximates the true distribution very well. Uh, it's almost indistinguishable from the, the blue line and the black lines are almost indistinguishable. Uh, the, the bigger your temperature is, however, the bigger is the deviation. The 0 0.3 temperature estimator deviates slightly more, especially in these uh, low logits areas where you see the significant gap between the orange line and the black line. And uh, if you uh, increase the temperature all the way up to uh, the unit temperature, then the, bi the bias is uh, much greater and uh, there is a significant disparity between the true gradient and the relaxed gradient. Uh, of course, uh, such gains in better approximation come at a cost and the cost is increased variance. You see that the blue line, the best uh, gradient estimator that we had on the left uh, plot has the highest variance. Its variance is much higher than uh, uh, the rest estimators have and uh, the green estimator which does the, uh, wor the worst job approximating the true gradient uh, as, is, as expected, has lowest, uh, the lowest variance. <coughs> okay, let us conclude this section. Uh, in, conclusion, uh, in conclusion, I should say that, um, so what we did, we just replaced our discrete random variables with the uh, continuous ones, which enabled the, uh, the reparameterization trick for gradient estimation. Uh, unfortunately, we changed the objective doing so and thus introduced the train test mismatch, which only, aid, which only adds extra headache uh, in practice. And also, uh, this relaxation depends on a hyperparameter that controls uh, how close you are to the discrete case, uh, and this hyperparameter needs to be tuned somehow. Uh, now, uh, I should say that uh, this is not the only possible relaxation. Uh, many other relaxations are possible, uh, but we didn't have time to cover them. Um, for I, I chose the Gumbel Softmax because uh, I found it kind of uh, more elegant, uh, more grounded than the alternatives, uh, and others are at times uh, feel very heuristic. So. Uh, Having considered the relaxation, I should say that uh, no matter, however, no matter which relaxation you ch you take, uh, it will always ha introduce some train test mismatch. Going for a continuous distribution during the test, uh, during the training stage, will be different than having a discrete uh, distribution during the tra uh, test stage. So, uh, in order to get rid of this train test mismatch, we should be training the discrete. Uh, case, uh, we should be uh, working with the discrete case during training. Uh, and uh, relaxation-based methods will not help us in, along this way. So instead, we'll get back to our uh, friend Reinforce, which we bashed in the beginning, and try to improve it and reduce its variance. So in order to reduce the variance of the Reinforce, we'll be using the very old and well-known statistical uh, technique called the control variance. The control variates uh, are based on the following identity. Suppose you have some function b of z that has a tractable expectation. b of z is a simple function. It's so simple that you can compute ex its expectation analytically. You can, uh, you can actually, for, for some reason, I don't know how, but uh, somehow you can compute the expectation of b of z over q. Uh, we'll define this as mu. Then the expectation of phi can be shown to be equal to this phi uh, to f of z minus b of z plus the bias that we introduced, uh, plus the mu that corrects the bias that we introduced by subtracting the b. Uh, now by defining, by, we will say, uh, we'll define this uh, estimator uh, as a red square, uh, yeah, by the way, for those who are um, first time in Moscow, here's the red square. Uh, I saved you a trip to the city center. Uh, so this red square uh, might be a lower uh, variance estimator. So uh, why did we bother with all this uh, uh, tricks, with all this algebra? It's because it might, le it might have lower variance. Uh, why so? Well, you can see that first the 
uh, adding a constant does not change the variance. Uh, mu is a deterministic constant. It does not contain any st stochasticity in it, so it does not increase the variance. So this is the variance of the red square is the same as the variance of f of z minus b of z, and uh, this uh, is equal to the sum of variances of f and b minus two times the covariance. So if the covariance between f of z is significantly high, then this uh, blue term, the sort of uh, change in variance, uh, that uh, we got by introducing this uh, um, b of z uh, will be negative. Uh, so we will actually have uh, the variance uh, of this uh, estimator reduced as compared to the original estimator, uh, Monte Carlo estimator f of z. Uh, the way we derived this estimator, it is an, un an unbiased estimator of the original identity. It might be a lower uh, variance estimator if you choose the b function right. Uh, you can choose any b function b you want as long as you can compute its expectation and uh, uh, however in general it does not guarantee the variance reduction. Uh, and this b of z, uh, it's called the control variate. This is the control variate uh, that the technique is called for. Uh, the intuition behind this technique is that you can think that of B of Z as kind of extracting the tractable part of the signal. F can be some complicated function, but uh, you can sort of decompose it into a tractable part, the B of Z, and deal with the intractable part, the F of Z minus B of Z, using the Monte Carlo. Uh, and this is, uh, uh, is essentially what's going on here. So how do we use uh, uh, con control variates with reinforcement learning? Well, you just write down the uh, estimate for uh, your reward function using uh, the baseline. Now, since our uh, generating distribution Q depends on phi, then the mu, the mu, the expectation of a baseline should also depend on phi. Uh, and now it is also a function of phi. Now, this uh, guy here is an unbiased estimate of the expected reward. We just differentiate it with respect to phi and uh, obtain the following estimate. Here, the first term is just a reinforced estimator for this uh, kind of changed uh, our uh, modified objective. And the second term is the standard gradient. The, there is uh, no stochasticity in mu again. Uh, so th this uh, gradient of mu with respect to phi is just a single, a simple derivative as you uh, have in the classical deep learning. Uh, so in the uh, reinforced related li literature, the B of Z uh, is usually called the baseline function and uh, it can be equivalently seen as a control variate of the form B of Z times gradient uh, of the log density with respect to phi. Uh, I guess uh, you could use other baselines, uh, other control variants as well, but this is the most convenient and uh, most popular one. Uh, again, uh, I should uh, note, note uh, that this is still an unbiased estimate of the gradient, uh, and uh, if you choose the B or Z right, then it will, have, uh, the it will give you reduced variance. Uh, so, how do you actually choose the baseline? Uh, which are, the, what are the possibilities? Uh, the simplest possible baseline uh, is the constant baseline. The B of Z that uh, completely ignores Z uh, and uh, gives you the same constant for every single uh, realization of random variable Z. Then the reinforced estimator is simply uh, the F of Z minus some constant times the gradient log density, and uh, luckily uh, this uh, extra term, the gradient of mu, is equal to zero because the c does not depend on phi. Uh, the, this is just some co constant with respect to phi. Uh, so so uh, its gradient with respect to phi will be equal to zero. So how do you choose the constant though? Uh, not every constant will work uh, equally good. Uh, and uh, luckily you can write down a formula for the optimal constant. The optimal constant, uh, 
will be will reduce the variance the most. So we'd like uh, to find the constant c such that the variance of this estimator is minimal. So we can just write down the formula for variance, and vari the form this formula will be just a quadratic formula with respect to c. The variance is kind of quadratic. Uh, so by simplifying this formula, you will get a quadratic uh, function of c, and by minimizing this quadratic uh, function, you get the following expression. It says uh, the C should be equal to this, this formula. Uh, it is not very, um, I, I don't think you can see much intuition behind this particular choice. Uh, just uh, the theory says that C should be uh, uh, equal to this formula. Uh, now, it has some uh, complicated expectations in the denominator and the in denominator, uh, but you could, uh, I guess, theoretically, um, uh, you could estimate uh, this expectation using running averages. Uh, although, beware uh, possibly high variance, because you see there is the gradient log density term lurking both in the nominator and the denominator. Uh, so, at least hypothetically, you could try uh, approaching uh, computing the optimal uh, baseline using uh, running averages. Uh, however, in some cases, for example, consider the VAE case, then uh, you don't have uh, the distribution, you don't have simply the uh, generating distribution of Z, but this distribution is conditioned on the observation X you have. So you have the Q of Z given X. Uh, and this means that the optimal constant will also be different for different Xs. Uh, now, you could uh, keep a separate optimal baseline for each training example you have, but this is first uh, not really practical. And then uh, what if you use techniques like data augmentation? What if you actually have infinite data? So the authors of the Neural Rational Inference and Learning paper have proposed to learn a network that generates these baselines. That uh, the network B of X that uh, ignores the Z, so it's a constant uh, baseline with respect to Z, but uh, conditioned on X, it outputs you the kind of constant approximation of F. And the, uh, the, the loss they, are, they chose to use to find, to optimize this uh, baseline network is simply an expected uh, mean squared error uh, between the function, between the reward function and the baseline network's output, uh, which you could use, uh, which you could optimize using the stochastic optimization techniques. Uh, moving to a more diff uh, to a more uh, powerful and complicated techniques, we can consider more. Uh, complicated uh, function approximations. For example, we can consider a first order Taylor expansion of the reward function at some point mu. If we know uh, in, in the first order information of uh, function f, namely its gradient, uh, and if we uh, know the, uh, this value mu, then we can consider a Taylor approximation, so just a uh, take the value of f at the point mu and multiply it uh, and add this uh, gradient of f at mu t times the z minus mu, the first order Taylor expansion at point mu. The particular mu will be taken uh, is uh, the expectation of, the, of our random variable z, which we assume to be available to us in certain problems. You do have uh, this expected value of z known, so you can uh, use uh, the following baseline, which uh, stands, uh, which is a method called muprop. muprop uh, since it's kind of does backpropagation through the mu function, uh, but I, I will comment on that later. So uh, it has uh, two terms. The first term is the again the reinforced with a modified re modified reward, and the sec second term is this gradient of the. Uh, bias that we introduced by subtracting the uh, baseline here. And uh, yeah, if you see at uh, what's going on here, then you can see that essentially uh, the second term represents a gradient through the kind of mean version of the uh, of your reward, the version where you just 
pushed the expectation inside the function and uh, replaced all stochasticity, all random variables with their expectations. Uh, of course, uh, this is not an unbiased estimate. This would not be an unbiased estimate uh, of the gradient, nowhere close to it. So in a sense, you do back propagation through this and then correct the uh, inaccuracies uh, of the problems, uh, the fine tune the inaccuracies using the reinforced estimator, uh, this term. Uh, you could, of course, consider the higher order Taylor expansion, say second order Taylor expansion. That would require first knowing the uh, covariance matrix of Z, uh, but uh, more importantly, uh, these higher order approximations are more computationally expensive. Working with matrices requires at least quadratic complexity in the dimensionality of Z. Uh, so this is one interesting idea, the idea that uh, the baseline can be dependent on the act, on the z as long as you can compute the expectation or somehow deal with the expectation of z. Uh, the second uh, powerful idea uh, in this area of control variates is the idea of variance minimization. So the baselines are uh, purely artificial. They do not belong to our original problem. We only introduce them to reduce the variance. So the most natural objective for uh, choosing uh, the baselines, for maybe learning the baselines, is the variance minimization. So uh, we seek to minimize the variance of our gradients. And uh, however, in general, you would expect uh, the bias variance uh, trade-off to be at play here. Like if you increase, decrease the variance, then probably the bias should increase. Luckily, in this case, we were guaranteed that uh, no matter which baseline you use, uh, as long as you do the uh, mean correction, then you will end up with an unbiased estimate, which means that uh, we do not sacrifice any bias for decreased variance, and we can uh, decrease variance all we want without introduction of any bias. Uh, now, then you can use the stochastic optimization techniques in order to uh, minimize this variance, variance of the gradients. Uh, for example, for the neural version of inference and learning estimator, uh, this one, uh, the more sensible objective rather than the mean squared error uh, to learn the baseline network would be to minimize the gradient of the, uh, to minimize the variance, sorry, of the baseline uh, reinforce, uh, which would uh, essentially lead to the following objective. It is very similar to the original objective, except we have this extra weight that is uh, equal to the gradient uh, log probability. Uh, yeah. Uh, now there are uh, there exist more advanced and more complicated uh, gradient estimators, uh, namely the rebar and the relax. Uh, the first one uses Gumbel relaxed random variables as baselines. Uh, yeah, question. Sorry. So uh, in this subjective or, or the other one uh, on the previous slide, basically the base <laughs> the baseline network will closely. Um, will closely follow the uh, 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 f of z, right? Um, follow, so, sorry, what? So, in this objective, the baseline network will closely follow uh, f of z. Right. So, why, why not use f of z directly? Uh, we, didn't, uh, so, the f of z depends on f, on Z, sorry, and we do not uh, we don't know how to compute its expectation. However, the B of X does not depend on Z, so its expectation is very simple. It's the same B of X. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Uh, so the rebar uh, is a very powerful and interesting technique. It uses Gumbel relaxed uh, random variables as the baseline, and uh, uh, th that is the rebar. And the relax uh, goes uh, even further, and it actually learns the optimal baseline uh, using the variance minimization principle I just talked about. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have uh, much time to go into much detail. Uh, if you're interested, you can, uh, I, should, I encourage you to uh, maybe read the papers or uh, read some other sources on the internet, uh, or maybe come talk to, with me after the talk. Um, so let's get back to the toy example we had during the relaxation discussion. Uh, 
since uh, the ver these reinforced-based methods are unbiased, it does not make any sense at looking at the uh, mean values of the gradients. They all would coincide with that black line, the true gradient. Uh, it only makes sense to look at the variance. And uh, you see that uh, for this optimal constant baseline is a very powerful one. So, for example, if you just use the reinforced without any baselines, that would be this uh, uh, blue line over there. And it has a pretty large variance, uh, almost worse than all other methods. Uh, if you use the mean squared error uh, constant baseline, uh, kind of similar to that of the neural variation of inference and learning paper, then that would give this gray line, uh, which is kind of better than the uh, standard reinforce, although not always, like in this region, it is uh, the worst estimator. But uh, it is not as good as the optimal constant baseline, this um, gr greenish, yellowish line uh, over there. And even the first order Taylor expansion, the mu prop estimator, is not always better. For example, in, in this region, it's worse than the constant, uh, than the optimal constant baseline. Uh, so th this shows uh, that um, even in, among the baselines, uh, it's, it's not always clear which one uh, is the best. Uh, so to put it all together, here on the right hand, uh, left hand side, you see the same plot from the relaxations that uh, shows you how good are different relaxations, just to remind you. And uh, on the right plot, we see relaxations in uh, dotted lines and uh, uh, reinforce estimators in solid lines, just to compare the two. Uh, you see that uh, this uh, poor green uh, gradient estimator, which has the lowest variance uh, and uh, kind of the highest bias, is uh, comparable or even sometimes uh, much better than all other uh, estimates. Uh, but well, sometimes it's uh, worse than the optimal constant baseline. Uh, whereas the uh, Gumbel softmax uh, with a 0 0.1 temperature uh, is actually worse than the reinforced estimator. Uh, so to conclude, uh, I have presented you with two different um, uh, approaches to this uh, problem of discrete random variables. The relaxation-based approaches, uh, in general, I would say, are easier to implement, uh, and they seem to work decently in practice. Uh, but uh, they introduce the train test mismatch, and uh, often they contain hyperparameters that you need to tune somehow. Uh, the variance reduction methods, on the other hand, they do not have, they do not introduce any uh, train test mismatch. They, you actually train the same thing you'll be using uh, during the test stage. Uh, they, uh, you can tune the hyperparameters using the variance uh, minimization framework. Uh, However, they are much harder to implement usually, uh, and um, it's not always clear whether the uh, uh, results are worth the added complexity, implementational complexity. Uh, so in the beginning, I said that uh, reinforce is uh, essentially a random search in disguise. So after adding, after uh, stuffing it with all these baselines, fancy baselines, we can say that this is now a random search in steroids. Uh, I should also say that this is still an ongoing topic of research. Many new methods appear uh, every year on, every, uh, on each uh, new conference. Um, and many other already existing methods we have left uncovered. So if you're interested in learning more, I suggest you go and read into this um, very interestingly looking website. Uh, it seems to contain a lot of um, um, scientific knowledge on the topic. Uh, and also I would recommend you so recently, researchers from DeepMind have published a very cool paper called Monte Carlo Gradient Estimation in Machine Learning. It's more of a review. Uh, it only concerns the continuous case, though, so it's not really our topic of discussion, but it's still a very interesting read, and uh, if you're curious, I suggest you go and read it. And on that note, I thank you for your attention, uh, and um, bon appetit. Uh, the lunch is ahead.